Welcome, Friends of the Planet. Happy Women's History Month. We are thrilled to be featuring women in the environmental world all this month. And today we are lucky to have with us Teki Akwete, who is the Director of Public Policy at Vulcan, a big technology company. And we're thrilled to be able to talk with her about some of the great work they're doing in ocean and wildlife conservation. Welcome, Teki. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real, it's a real pleasure. We're so glad to have you. So tell us a little bit more about what Vulcan is up to on climate, oceans, and wildlife. I know those are all areas of focus. What kinds of projects are you working on? So Vulcan is a company that was founded by the late Paul Allen, who also co-founded Microsoft back in the 80s. And really what our mission is, it's quite simple. And I think that's why I'm so thrilled to be a part of this team and company is to make and leave the world a better place. And through those sort of very simple missions. We have four domain areas that we focus on, and that's focus on wildlife conservation, oceans, communities. And so really the way that we go about our approach is like looking at the world's biggest problems and what are sort of the tech and science and partnerships that can drive solutions to these really critical challenges. I think, you know, 2020 was such a devastating year in many ways, and but what it really shone a light on is the need to sort of think of innovation creativity, but absolutely partnerships through this. And so that's where I think Vulcan really brings its presence to the global stage is thinking about what partnerships don't exist that Vulcan can convene together. And then I think, especially for my role is like looking at this through a federal government relations lens. But my focus also has been on the international side because we realize not governments can do it alone, but firms can't do it alone either. And just bringing that all together. And, you know, this past year during the pandemic, pandemic has really shown us the need for conservation. And if we don't get this right and dedicate more resources toward conservation, we can see another pandemic again. Yes. And so I wanted to ask, Vulcan implements technology to help expand conservation. And could you tell us a little bit more about the types of projects you're up to and, you know, what kind of great work you guys are getting up to around coral reefs and beyond? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. I'm actually reminded that this week is Monaco Ocean Week. So there's a lot of global summits going on on talking about ocean health and conservation. One thing that I am so thrilled to sort of understand and better learn about is that in our global fund for coral reefs, which is the first UN multi-donor trust fund dedicated to SDG 14, which looks at, you know, life under the water. And what it does is it brings together governments, private sector, and NGOs. And the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation is thrilled to be an establishing partner on this to really think about what is the status of the coral reefs. And then locally on the ground, what projects can help, can we help support to ensure that coral reef health and resilience is not only maintained, but thrives. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of like acronyms going around, I think, especially in DC and slogans. And there's this language we always hear about building back better. But I think for Vulcan and the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, it's also really about building back bluer as well. And we think of coral reefs really as like the canary in the coal mine. So if the yeah. coral reefs are, you know, really upsetting and decimated, then, you know, we have a much larger problem. And it didn't really take COVID for us to know this. This has been a problem for some time, but galvanizing international support. So uh, two weeks ago, we announced our first seven projects, which is really exciting. I love that. Build back bluer. I'm going <laughs> to remember that and use that again. That's a great phrase because yeah. sometimes the oceans get forgotten in that effort to build back. You know, people think they're so healthy and they're so big, they can't possibly be hurting, but they're really very fragile and they're yes. in a lot of trouble. One of the other things that is troubling in the ocean, and, and I know you may know a little bit about this, is the problem with illegal, unregulated, and unreported, or IUU fishing. Tell us about what Vulcan's done in that area, because I know that that's something that has been of interest for a while for Vulcan, given your technology, Ben. No, that's a great question. And also, I think just the data is coming out so much more on the problem of IUU fishing. Um, and so where Vulcan really uses and leverages its technology and expertise is our product called Skylight. And that is a, basically a domain awareness system that tracks vessels in oceans. It could be, you know, there is a ship in 
the MPA area or something that looks suspicious, Skylight will use that data to help understand the behavior that's going on there and then send it back to our partners to really understand that detail. I think what's really exciting is that Skylight is deployed across the globe. And what we're really hoping to do as we understand the problem of IUU is increase its presence globally as well. So it's been a historic presence for Vulcan, but I think what we're really excited about and thinking about like ocean health, ocean resilience, but then also what comes along with that is IUU fishing and how it's such a complex problem. It touches on modern slavery, piracy, and all, all those difficult issues that we know exist. So to dive even deeper, pun intended, yes. on the issue <laughs> of the ocean, you know, we often hear that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the bottom of the ocean. And so can you tell us a bit more about the work that you're doing in ocean exploration and why this is important. I think, as you say, there is so much that is unknown yet. And that's, I think, really where we want to leverage the unknown to help solve problems. So, you know, where we're thinking about is who are the partners that are really working on the ground now and what gaps exist? I know governments are stretched so thin at the moment, and there's only so much that they can focus on, especially as we think about the dual health and economic crises that sometimes, you know, this issue slips to the bottom. So really thinking about what is the gaps that exist at the moment and how can either Vulcan or in our sort of convening power with the Paul G. Allen Foundation bring together partners to look at the evidence on this really tricky issue. I think it's there's some really exciting announcements that will come out shortly, but what's fantastic is knowing that we don't necessarily have all the data we need. There are gaps in there for how can we be partners in helping to understand a bit more. So can I ask just a little more about that. I think when a lot of us think about ocean exploration, we think about, you know, the submarine and Titanic going down to the very depths, but what does ocean, I mean, what, what are you exploring? What does that actually look like? That's a really good question. I think what in practice, it's really looking at the science, right? So funding researchers to look at the data. Another thing we are conscious of is because we focus on partnerships. What we don't want to do is to be seen to come in and show someone how they should do something. So really identifying who are the leaders that are doing excellent work in this space and how do we then support them even more on on this agenda looking at sort of who are the scientific leaders how can we help either via our technology or our partnerships to help them understand that data at the moment it's really nascent so it's hard to identify just one exceptional project Mm -hmm. but what I think we are most excited about is really the scope of the work and then how we can bring it to, to bear. There's so much to learn about the ocean still. It's so vast and we know so little. So every bit of effort that you all can help along, every bit of that science, particularly at a time when people don't trust science, Mm -hmm. the more we can bring it to life, the better. So that's awesome news. Last question is, you know, we started off saying that this is Women's History Month and you're working at one of the most important organizations in the U.S. funding conservation and the environment. And there's so many women leaders like you that are coming up through the ranks. So tell us, what do you say to young women who want to have a career like this? What inspired you? How did you get where you are today? And what advice do you have for them? Yeah, no, uh, this is actually one of my favorite questions that I get asked often because I think every person's journey into leadership is so different. So one thing that I always say is it's not linear, right? I actually started off my career as a sixth grade elementary school teacher and I was so enthusiastic about just thinking about future generations and what it means and what, you know, hope looks like and inspires them. And then I realized there is so much more to grasp. I actually am a daughter of a foreign service officer. So my very formative early years were spent on the continent. I remember very vividly, you know, running home from school and to go play on the beaches of Dar es Salaam as well. So the things that impact you, I think always hold them with you. They're what makes you who you are. And so leadership trajectory is not linear. I would also say a part of that is also knowing your values and yourself. Because my journey has been 
isn't sort of like a rubber ball, you throw it against the wall and ping pong and that's where it lands is where I found myself, is that success, promotion isn't necessarily a definition of success. And if you can wake up and sort of be happy in the job that you're doing, you're already right on the track that you need to be. And then I think the other thing for me is really embracing sort of diversity and inclusion, whatever scope that means for you. You know, 2020 was such a year that made us realize there are a lot of things that need to be challenged and understood and the status quo doesn't necessarily work for everyone. How does anyone's journey help bring more voices to the table? I think that is always what I will advocate and lead from is thinking about who is not at the table, why are they not at the table, and how do we give them a voice um, is real is I it's what I would uh, say. But I, I love that. I love that question. I met you, Techie, when you convened a meeting at your former employer, the British Embassy of Women Leaders in Conservation with the ambassador to the U.S. And I yes. was so thrilled to get to be a part of that. You care immensely about supporting other women and lifting other women up. So thank you for that. Oh my gosh. No, like no thanks necessary. You know, when we think about who are the excellent people, it was, it was a no brainer um, for us to, to have you. And I'm, what I'm actually so thrilled about is that it continues, right? Like the friendships and the mentoring that you start along the way continues um, um, lifelong as well. Absolutely. And I have to put in a plug for my mom, who was a sixth grade teacher who's watching now. Hi, mom. I love it. <laughs> Anyone who can teach sixth graders has the patience. Yeah, you can do anything. You can do anything. So thank, thank you so, so much. much, Techie. It was a pleasure. It really was. And thank you for all of the great work that you do. When I, you know, I say when I start my day, I definitely go and read ODP as the first understanding of what, what's on the, on the docket. That's thank so kind of you. Thank you. We look forward to talking to you soon. Absolutely. Thank you.